Hey guys, it's Samuel Larson here, and I am here with uh, Max Sinclair from uh, Snowball Media. He's running a ton of Google Ads, Facebook Ads, etc. I just wanted to grab him over here and uh, pick his brain on what are the newest developments, like what can you as a trustful and loyal subscriber to this channel learn from uh, Max. So first of all, if we can get to like a super brief uh, to the point intro from Max himself, and then uh, I'll jump into the questions right away. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. So, um, yeah, it's Snowball Creations is my business. I've uh, been in the kind of marketing world for uh, probably seven or eight years now, I think, running my own uh, agency. And uh, specifically now we, we completely focus on paid advertising. So that's uh, Google ads, uh, Facebook ads and LinkedIn are some of our favorites. But then we also play with uh, Twitter and a few other channels. Um, yeah, so that's my background. And um, particularly love paid ads, but for sure we have a lot of crossover with your world of uh, uh, trying to optimize websites and, and make them more effective. So it's yeah, fun to talk to yourself. Yeah, it's always good to connect. Like we feel like uh, we're kind of like the dinosaurs already in this industry because we've been around for yeah. so long. And uh, welcome, by the way, I forgot to welcome you to the channel. But like, first of all, I would be really curious to hear about this uh, Facebook and Google split because uh, we have some clients that uh, are only doing Facebook and some that are only doing, doing Google. And like uh, very few are actually doing uh, both or at least doing both uh, effectively. So mm. how do you see like, uh, since you have like this uh, multi-year perspective, like how has that changed over the years? And like, how is the split right now like uh, for your clients? Yeah, so uh, we have um, a mixture of different, some clients of ours will have both Facebook and Google running for their business. Some of them have uh, Google with LinkedIn. Uh, there's always like different combinations um, and it's really a case of firstly, you know, what's most appropriate for each business. But we've definitely seen uh, Facebook has become less of the cool kid on the block is the best way to describe it. Like it's uh, the challenges it's had uh, with the iOS update, for example, and things like that. Is, and also just its own brand has struggled uh, with um, certain views of, you know, Zuckerberg himself and the Netflix documentary and stuff. So it, that, that's kind of an impact of it that it was always the favorite. Um, and then there's Google is kind of like the, for sure, an old dinosaur of, of like everything. Like it was the OG of, of the paid world, really. And, um, but, but then there's, so that's kind of the view of them. But then in reality, it's what makes people money. And uh, both of them are still the leading platforms in their own areas. Like they, they follow their own needs. So certain companies are appropriate to be on Facebook versus Google versus maybe another channel. But uh, it's also which ones work. So like TikTok's very cool, but it doesn't work as well as Facebook and Instagram does yet. So the platform, the promotion of, of the products to actually make e-commerce sales is not as effective yet with TikTok. We've not seen any, we've tested it, then we haven't seen results as strong as Facebook and Instagram can deliver um, so far, yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's kind of like a cheap crap platform yeah. so far. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, actually, this is like something I wanted to dive into with you specifically, because like, 2021 Facebook versus 2022 Facebook. Like if you look at just a, a year back, they didn't know anything about the iOS updates or like they were very much like uh, not uh, relevant. How has that changed right now? Like uh, are things a lot more difficult in that? Like uh, how much harder is it? And like, uh, how is this like overall looking right now? Yeah, so, so really there was a period where there was huge drop-offs for various clients with Facebook ads in particular. And they, there was a lot of change that needed to happen to correct for that. So it was very significant in, in, in the impact it had. Um, I think uh, that is whether it lasted that impact is the real question and, and how Facebook reacted to it. And Facebook's reacted very well. Uh, they've made many different kind of backdoor deals to, to, to try and really circumnavigate to move around uh, the tracking that they were using previously. So just direct connections into the various platforms which you're selling into so that you can still track those users directly through to that particular website. So for example, Shopify has a direct relationship with Facebook. And so the quality of the data you're receiving is still extremely high, even if somebody hasn't chosen to allow for like cross app tracking and things like that. Um, I think one of the so so I think these changes they've been making has allowed for uh, Facebook to still stay as a really strong opportunity. I just think that there's a lot more uh, kind of like classic little red flags or things that you know that you need to put in place to make it still work effectively. And if you don't, then you will suffer and you will struggle. So I think it's a bit less. 
uh, beginner friendly, possibly, um, compared to how it used to be, where someone could just turn on some ads and it would work out for them at the beginning. Uh, and that's less the case now. But if you know what you're doing, it's still really one of the leaders in the market for, for an opportunity for paid advertising. Um, yeah, and with, with Google, it's really the most stable, solid opportunity that hasn't changed. Like it's still extremely good. It's uh, um, expensive, but for good reason. The buying intent uh, behind each person coming into your website is so high. Like I'm sure you've seen this as somebody who works in website conversions that the difference in each channel, of course, is so drastic, like uh, organic versus paid and network referrals versus other types of, of, of advertising. And, and Google always, almost always is like a big step ahead of most of those other channels into your website for traffic. So I think that it's still so consistent. Um, so yeah, it's a, a big favorite for me personally, yeah, to work on. Yeah, yeah that's interesting because uh, yeah, I heard uh, a lot of crying about this uh, iOS updates and these kinds of things. And then like uh, it kind of went down, like people weren't complaining that much. But then um, I guess it's like uh, natural that like in an auction system, like some parts, like the, some people that are just not doing it that well, will get uh, pushed out of the market, and the market mm. will then tend to balance itself. And mm. uh, the ones that are doing it uh, in an excellent manner, so like uh, the champions will keep winning in mm. uh, that scenario. Okay, like um, what about Google then? Because uh, iOS updates like uh, came to Facebook. I heard a lot of uh, talk about this, but not so much when it came to Google. So how has that like? Uh, changed uh, say over the past uh, year or not yeah so they have moved to there is uh things like automated bidding strategies have been around but they are changing and how you use those changes uh there's things like uh responsive search ads have become just really the standard and i think it's uh, only in a, you know a couple as of the recording it's only a few months away that the expanded text ads are completely going so it will only be an option to use responsive search ads so some things like that have changed uh also uh, there's broad match, phrase match, and exact match, and those you can't really even call them broad, phrase, and exact because exact is not really exact. Uh, phrase is more broad, and broad is really, really broad. <laughs> so <laughs> the kind of intent of a search is much more recognised in the uh, options that Google uses for each of the keywords you set. So, for example, if you were to set, uh, if you're trying to sell shoes, you might have i don't know uh, sports shoes as a keyword but but it might also show for a phrase match it might still show you or even an exact match for trainers for example so that's a completely different word actually but because it's a close variant in google's eyes you will show up on both of those so it's quite an interesting change which means that you have to be even tighter in some ways and also kind of just embrace that fact that google is going to do this for you and just be very aware of your negatives and stuff so i think that's one of the big differences is google is always trying to take more control away from you so you have to be very aware of that because it's not always in your best interests actually to, to allow for that release of control because sometimes those uh keywords that are close variants are just not correct maybe you don't sell trainers or something maybe it is genuinely something different to that so thinking being aware of it is very important mm, okay yeah actually remember this as well they've done this before as well where like yeah. uh, the terms used to mean something and then they change uh, the meaning and kind of like a little nice backdoor technique to them. and that's just like uh, most people want to make the changes so it's a yeah. good business strategy from uh, google's uh, perspective but it's uh, good to be vigilant and uh, yeah they, they have a, they have a great one called performance max now which is like the mm -hmm. super open uh -huh. campaign where you can just do anything and everything basically as google's eyes and, and if you've got a, a ton of money and lots of conversion data, it actually can do well. But in 90% in of the cases, like probably like 98%, it will not do well. Like it, it does not work out for somebody. So yeah, it's, it's funny how much they try and push in that direction in, in one way or another. Performance Max sounds so good, obviously. So <laughs> Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And uh, I think the, often the only thing that maximizes is uh, Google's financial performance. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, definitely this like a uh, perverse incentive. They're like, uh, yeah, we'll help you, but like... Uh, We'll, of course, like primary look uh, at our own self-interest. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, we have these two platforms, the two giants. We have Facebook, Google going on in the boxing match. And yeah. uh, we have like, a, of course, like a wide variety of clients and stores and uh, these kinds of things. So like, uh, I'm thinking like, if there is some kind of like a rule of thumb of like, who should primarily be in Google, who should primarily be in Facebook, and perhaps even like who should be on both, like uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you could give to the audience. 
so yeah so there's 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 a couple of main points really the first is uh are people googling for the problem that your product solves so that's the simplest way to try and describe it is if somebody isn't searching through google for what you offer then of course you can't get that audience there is no audience it's a uh, but it's built off of the uh, searches that are sent through the network every day. So if they aren't being searched, there is no audience. That's the main difference between the search networks for advertising versus display networks, which is an inspiration purchase. So that's the main question is, is the product, for example, maybe an entirely new offering, a new type of product, which maybe hasn't yet existed in the market. So people don't even know to search for that. Um, you can still get to those people through Google with some higher uh, up the funnel kind of keywords, which might be, say, uh, let's say you have like a new type of, uh, I don't know, uh, cleaning product for some situation. Maybe someone talks about having the issue of a smell or something rather than looking for the specific solution, which is like a, a deodorizer or whatever the thing is. Like a, so uh, they don't know that there is the solution, but they do know they have the problem. So you can potentially still find them, but the quantity is a lot less and it's further up the funnel. So it's, it's less valuable, basically. Um, so that's the first question. Whereas with Facebook, you're able to get to those people because it's a display network. It's an interruptive uh, process of somebody who's just sat there on Instagram or Facebook, uh, staring at memes. And then ultimately, at some point, uh, you interrupt them with something that you think is going to be correct. And you obviously, this is based on Facebook's um, data um, and basically trying to create these profiles, these kind of puppets of somebody. And that's how you're able to, to, to find the right people and, and make purchases. So you, you have access to everybody with Facebook and Instagram, essentially, because it's so big. Whereas with Google, you only have that kind of bottom percentage. Um, but I would say, it, so depending on that question, I would then say, if you do have people searching for you with Google, then we personally most often would recommend starting with Google as a kind of foundational channel, and then Facebook and Instagram as a secondary channel. So if you've got the budget, do both uh, Google and Facebook. But if you have a smaller budget and you're just trying to basically find your first paid sales, like your first channel with paid advertising, we more often would recommend Google because it, it is uh, essentially the easier wins. We, we just, whether maybe we're just better at it, but who knows? But from this is a common experience, I think, from other people that I speak to, other business owners, and when I uh, meet them and take over their accounts, that, that, we're more likely to find you a, a quick wins with with Google ads um, and hit that. The, the nice way to describe it is that bottom 20 percent who are most likely to want to go ahead on making a purchase for your particular products because they're in the exact moment of trying to solve that problem. Whereas with Instagram and Facebook, you're reaching that broader audience. Um, and so you have a bit more work to do to convince that person to go ahead. But it does give you access to that larger audience. So Google is a kind of has to be Googled for it. So that's the first question. And then are you going for your first foundational channel or are you really trying to scale outwards? And then I think there's a few nuances beyond that, which is just, are you a very visual product or story? Because of course, Facebook and Instagram have endless opportunity for like video images, crazy carousel, you know, story type different angles. And Google has basically nothing like the display network is not a converting network really for most businesses and search is where you're going to be using it. There is shopping, so you do have some uh, image-based content available, like real estate, basically, um, but it's pretty limited compared to, to, to Facebook. So if you really need to tell a story visually, then then that's when Facebook and Instagram, again, might be the better option, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you mentioned there something that uh, I picked up on, like uh, the bottom 20% of like the most, most like interested purchasers. And um, one thing I hear a lot is uh, Google Apps are expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have probably a little bit of this balance of, uh, okay, they are actually searching to solve these problems and uh, it's an auction-based system. So they probably should be fairly expensive if it's an uh, effective market. But then mm -hmm. um, what's your view on this? Like, uh, are Google ads uh, very expensive? Are they very competitive, uh, et mm -hmm. cetera? Mm -hmm. so, so I would say you actually talked about this earlier. You mentioned it, that realistically, any ad network is just a big auction system. And there's going to be people who have ineffective businesses who haven't even found product market fit who are bidding in that. And then there's people who have uh, extremely established, have unbelievably strong offers. Uh, me and you had a conversation the other day and literally, you know, that the offer, the proposition and, and how valuable that is. Some people can make that like a rock star offer that just knocks it out of the park. And other people struggle to even, you know, be financially like competitive with other, other offerings. 
So, so really, uh, in any network, um, if you can't, it just depends on where you are on that spectrum. So if you believe that your business is one of the better in your particular industry in terms of the value proposition, then you will win out. You will be able to make a profitable system for yourself. If you don't yet have product market fit, then you'll likely struggle. But then that's the case with every form of marketing, <laughs> because if you don't have product market fit, you're, you're pretty much screwed. So it's... Uh, um, I think that's the thing to be thinking about. And exactly like you said, the market ultimately settles into a fair balance. So for example, with Google Ads in uh, as a PPC agency, you might spend £20 for one click to go into your website, which sounds mental, for especially for e-commerce people, like largely who might be selling much less items. But if we're going to be making, say, 20, 30, 40,000 pounds over the lifetime of a client for us, then of course, 20 pounds for a click, if we convert you know, one in 10 of those clicks or one in 20 of those clicks, that's still unbelievably profitable for us. So we're happy to spend it. So the marketplace dictates that. Uh, but again, if we were a bad agency and we charged 400 pounds and we only ever kept someone for one month because we sucked at ads, then of course, those math, that maths wouldn't work out very well for us. So I think you actually said it quite well before. So I think the market dictates where you sit. And as long as your business is sound and your website converts, et cetera, as well, then then the ads uh, will be in your favor. Okay, yeah, so it's a pretty simple rule. It just needs to be better than the competition. Then yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to dive into this a little bit further. So on Google, we have uh, like two big uh, ad types, uh, search and shopping. Of course, you have display as well and uh, possibly like other things, but uh, these tend to be the main ones that uh, at least my clients focus on. So how do you see like, um, kind of like the rough split here of like, how much of the budget is generally going for the search campaigns and how much is going for shopping? And uh, how do you see like a path, like a performance wise? As well? mm. Yeah, so it's uh, um, for sure search was always the number one campaign type to be using in the past. So that has always been the leader and it still is very effective in many cases. Uh, for e-commerce though, specifically the uh like it's really, I would say the split between shopping and search is, is definitely in favor of shopping. So we would, I'd probably, if I tried to put a number on it, I would say on average about 60% 60, 60 roughly of the budget would go into the shopping campaigns and say 40% into search campaigns. So a classic kind of mix we might put together might be uh, a uh, primary, depending on what their products are, obviously you might have a marketplace with like many, many products and versus just one product. But let's say as a kind of a middle ground as a, a good example for you, might be uh, one shopping campaign with say, let's say they've got like a 2K per month budget. So I might put say 1,200 into the shopping campaign. I might put say maybe 700, 800, uh, let's say 700 into the search campaign. And that would be like a general search for the particular need that they cover. Or I might focus on one particular part of their marketplace if it's a larger mix of products. And then a small, maybe like 50 to 100 pounds into probably a brand campaign to just protect them against their competition for their like little core little bubble of the world. Because um, you only need to spend a very small amount on that with a nice manual cost per click we normally would use. Uh, and you can get it very cheap because it's your brand. So um, that's probably the mix currently that we most often would be going with. Um, and again, there's some variations around that, which would be how visual is your product? Because if it is very visual, then there is an image extension now with search campaigns, but it only shows up sometimes. And shopping is like front and center, top of the page, big image for every single product. So if you have like a very funny, interesting, unique product look or image, then of course that could be really great. And sometimes it might be that, we just find search just doesn't work. Like we have one product, which is literally a boot banana. It's a boot banana uh, thing that sits inside of the climbing shoes to stop them from smelling. Um, and it's uh, weird as hell, but it does very well. It's very popular, but that's so weird that you need to see that product and that does really well. So for them, we've you know moved almost exclusively to shopping because it's just perfect for them. And the search just doesn't do it justice what that product is. So it, it depends uh, on the product again, in terms of visual, like how visual it is. Yeah, if that answers, it gives you a good image. Yeah, it does, yeah. Okay, that's good. We've been talking quite a bit on Facebook and Google. Just a couple more questions on this topic, and then we can look at like some of the hidden opportunities of uh, new paid channels that you've seen uh, working recently. But like um, here, people are always, uh, and I think this is one of the most valuable questions to business owners, because like they are something that they are doing wrong. And mm. what are some of these common mistakes that you see like, uh, on both Facebook and Google that mm. the e-commerce merchants are making. And if they just fix that, like they would get like a 
better results for sure. Yeah. So definitely, I'm sure this is the same for you, is the foundations are, uh, uh, of course, the website. So that needs to be fully functional. Like there's some shoppers that you sometimes see where literally even the actual flow of e-commerce isn't properly set up or payment systems aren't in the right places. So those simple red flags, just kind of double check those. Uh, and then going into the ads, uh, it's, the, it's the foundations again. So conversion tracking properly set up. So do you know your numbers? Do you know... Uh, what your conversion rates are. Do you have even just e-commerce tracking set up properly with, with us? We use Google Analytics connected into Google Ads so that we can track that. But you also probably have secondary conversions sometimes. So maybe, you know, you might get B2B leads through your e-commerce store occasionally or something. So track all of these other things and just make sure that you're, you have a real picture. Um, and then with understanding lifetime value is also important. So some stores understand actually that lifetime value is, is most of their revenue. If you're a marketplace, perhaps you get someone to sign up their initial spend is not that great, but they're going to then continue to buy from you as a subscription for many months after. So keeping that into account with Facebook, the, the, again, tracking with the Facebook pixel, but also making sure you verify your domain is one of the things that we now need to do and um, structure your events uh, in terms of which are prioritized for your conversions. So this is very often missed. Um, and then I think across the two of them, uh, the thing that I see the most often is just a bad AB testing infrastructure. So you, a clear matrix that says, I'm trying to learn, again, similar to your work and with websites, like I have a hypothesis. I think that uh, X scenario is the case. So I'm going to clearly test that with two variations against each other and see the results. So for example, we might be testing uh, three different audiences and then uh, three different images. So we would have a clear, clean structure of three campaigns, each with the different image. And within each of those campaigns, it would be three ad sets, each with the different ad set or sorry, audience. So then you have you clearly know which of the audiences has done best because it's equal across all three of those. And again, you clearly know which of those images has done best because it's fair because each of those has the same audiences. So being very precise and like uh, OCD, basically very regimented and structured about how you set up this this kind of infrastructure of tests is very often missed and messy. Like people just have one audience and one thing with two different images and the other is a slightly different audience with another two different images. So you have no idea which audience was better or which images were better because the, they overlap in the wrong places. And so it's just not a fair test. So it's like going back to your like science classes when you're a kid, like make sure you uh, follow your science teacher. That's probably the best advice. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I actually like quite surprised that the mistakes tend to be a bit similar. So like they are like basic mistakes, and then like uh, you fix your tracking, take care of the basics, and then like uh, you are at least like covered for the biggest mistakes. Yeah, um, yeah that's uh, definitely that learning question is like interesting because I also bump into that all the time. So like um, people cannot answer the question of like what did we learn by doing this. So like mm. the answers of like uh, yeah, X works better than Y, but like nothing else. Like uh, you don't know like. Uh, any kind of ongoing learning from that. So there's a lot um, of overlap here on the optimization. And, and like all marketing is, is just like test, learn and repeat and optimize. Like you, you, you test a bunch of things, you take the good bits, you get rid of the bad bits and you repeat that over and over again. So you systematically improve over time. That is literally all marketing is. So making the system work around that is, is doing it well. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's such a simple concept and like people miss this probably also because mm -hmm. it is such a simple concept like build yeah. measure learn loop and you just like stay on that loop and like don't yeah. stop the loop and then they're doing it better definitely because of that mm -hmm. okay mm, that's very interesting that's um very like um, today related now you have a unique perspective to the future because uh, you are basically like uh, Facebook ads and Google ads on your brain all the time, you sleep and uh, eat and uh, yeah, everything with this. So yeah. I wanted to ask you about this, like uh, if we go say a couple of years into the future, take a little time machine, how do these uh, two giants and the advertising in them look uh, then? And like, what kind of changes are you predicting then? Like, what should we be aware of uh, that is uh, going to happen? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think um, when we're in our, um, when we've got neural link and connected to, uh, connected to our brains through Elon Musk's superpowers that he's gonna be giving us, et cetera, um heading off to mars <laughs> will there be facebook ads on mars <laughs> um so i think that uh of the two of them let's start with facebook so i think facebook is an interesting journey ahead of it i think uh 20 like let's say over the next two or three years i think that facebook will move past the challenges it's had 
with uh, tracking and conversion data, that, those kinds of issues, because it, it really has to. And it's one of the biggest companies in the world. And it's really its core moneymaker is this system. Um, and it's already doing it. There's no, there's no kind of true blocks for it to stop that from happening. Um, I think that it is, of course, now named Meta. There's Meta who owns uh, Facebook. So I do think in another maybe three or four years, we're going to start to actually see places like the Metaverse actually have real actual kind of clout behind them, enough weight behind the, the audiences in them that there may start to be opportunities in that kind of world and space. Um, but a lot of the time with these things, being the first mover doesn't really work out actually very well for you because the systems aren't built out enough for you to actually benefit. And the mass market is not on those systems. Like if you go in the Metaverse right now, it'd be a pretty, pretty quiet network of audiences to try to target. Um, but I think that that's exciting. And I, I think understanding that and how TikTok, of course, is going to have an impact. But Facebook did a very smart move along to, quite a few years ago now, obviously, with buying Instagram. And that's given them real space to, to live on for, for the years ahead. Um, Facebook, though, I, I think in itself is going to continue, continue to drop off. Uh, and then with Google, I, I really think it's the safest of any of them. I think it's the thought of them being replaced as the place for people to go to to have their problem solved is so much less of a thought to me. Like, uh, I think that the only way they can be disrupted now is going to be really, truly disruptive solutions in a completely new way where it's you know, entirely new levels to this that we can't even imagine, like something like Neuralink, where it's like just a simpler thing to just think your problem being solved rather than uh, going into Google and typing it kind of thing or using Google's uh, uh, um, home things to just speak out loud or something. Like, I think there really needs to be something that big to try to move Google out of the way. And I think in terms of the realities of the actual platform, is they're going to just try to automate it more and more. But that human marketer is still so key uh, for example, the Google ad reps love to give advice to everybody who uses that platform every month and every single month it's horrendous. Like it's the most common thing we deal with is audits where someone said, oh yeah, but the Google rep told me to use dynamic ads and to do this, 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 maximize conversions. And then they're just getting squat. Uh, like we literally just turned on an account just last week and going from dynamic ads and everything that Google reps have told them to do to go into how we run them, which was like an entirely built out campaign. We went from like around 4% um, average click-through rate on the adverts to 22% click-through rate on the adverts. So that's how drastically different it is from what the reps and what Google tells you to do to what is actually the right decision. So that gap is not going to just go away just because Google's algorithm gets smarter because understanding humans is still very difficult. We're very awkward things <laughs> to try to understand. So I think, uh, but it will move that direction though still and, and we'll be more empowered to um, uh, with better tools still to, to, to do it better. And shopping for sure is going to continue to improve. So for e-commerce specifically, I think more, more, more like um, real world over the next say year ahead, shopping is definitely a place to be spending money if you're an e-commerce brand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's always interesting to look at, back at some of the things that we thought would be huge. Like mm. uh, five years ago, there was voice search. That was like the big thing. Mm. And like uh, then, uh, yeah, nobody's really focusing on that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's uh, very true. I believe like Google has one of the strongest uh, combative modes. That is uh, the most difficult thing to for the competition to take away. Like you have the like terminology, even like on behalf of Google, like googling it and like uh, these kinds of things. So, and if there is uh, some other way or some other company that is uh, coming to mess with them, they have the yeah. smartest engineers and like billions to throw at it like, to compete with this. So, I think uh, it would be very difficult for anyone to come and mm -hmm. sort of. Uh, take their lunch yeah okay and uh, so that's google and facebook like and uh, i wrapped up but i wanted to ask you about this thing like, because uh, there's always channels that come and go of course like google and facebook have uh, been there pretty much the longest like uh, being the most consistent channels but often at least like in my thinking in my ignorant thinking like uh, i always think like uh, hey the news channels there must be like opportunity there because uh, people have already sort of maximized google and facebook and mm -hmm. they're like a new merchants called uh, go there, make some money with like say Pinterest ads or these kinds of things. So what mm -hmm. are some of the other or like big day channels that uh, you've seen uh, work recently that could uh, provide some good opportunities? Yeah, so I think that we, we like like I say, we, we work with others and uh, sometimes they work great in comparison and it's uh, um, a big complicated kind of um, spectrum where each network has its own unique audience. So that audience is one of the big parts of making ads work, of course. So 
for example, uh, we work with B2B clients too. So this is less e-commerce. Uh, this is more for B2B, but LinkedIn uh, ads is amazing. Like they've got the insight tag now. So their platform is very much working comparatively alongside Facebook in terms of the functionality, so in terms of uh, remarketing and everything that you have available to you. Um, and then there's uh, some of the others. You can't ignore TikTok. It's huge. And uh, it is getting better quickly. Uh, and I think if you have a very young audience and you use it in combination with something like Instagram, it can be really effective, is what we've seen. Like you can get some really impressive ROAS that direction. Um, and then there's uh, Twitter is still here. And if you're looking for, say, developers, or if you're in like crypto, then Twitter can be a good place to head. So there's little bubbles uh, all over the world. Uh, we like, we're interested in Quora, for example, people going there for answers for business mm -hmm. questions. So uh, again, for B2B, that could be an interesting opportunity. And Pinterest. Pinterest, I feel like Pinterest is one of the healthiest social networks because they've grown very cleanly. They're a very healthy business in terms of their actual uh, team behind them. They're, they're not spammy. They've not taken these kind of aggressive, ugly paths to try to grow themselves. And they've just very consistently gone upwards with a very devoted female audience who just spend huge amounts of time on there. And it's built around a lot of outlinking out of Pinterest anyway. So it's very naturally made for people to, to buy from there. So if you're in a kind of female, uh, if you're looking for a female audience, especially in that kind of like uh, visual products like fashion or jewelry and craft, et cetera, then it's a really great one to look at as well. And again, it's, it's cheaper Pinterest. So it's a nice one to put alongside possibly Facebook and Instagram or Google uh, to just drive good traffic to yourself. So those are some of the others that we like. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. Yeah, I tend to randomly pump into Pinterest. I don't know if I'm like an interior yeah. core target audience, but like they have yeah. very good SEO. Like, uh, yeah. Like, uh, find this and then like a good hook, hook to like look at similar images and uh, mm. these kinds of things. So like a really interesting platform there from mm. that perspective. And I think it's like, uh, yeah, definitely for like a female audience. Uh, there's mm. uh, of course like Facebook, but like I always think of like uh, Google as being like more straightforward and like a more of a male platform. Mm. And uh, I think like you probably have, uh, of course like shoppers everywhere. Okay, yeah. this has been great and very interesting. So. Any like uh, closing advice or recommendations to all the different merchants listening to this uh, interview that mm. uh, you could give to save them uh, millions in ad spend and uh, yeah. <laughs> make a few more millionaires? Yeah, so I think um, uh, probably one, one thing I would just say is make sure that you're ticking off those basics. So the foundational stuff, there'll be some people listening to this who are very early on. And so those foundations of if you're in Facebook, just, just search like what to do about the iOS update. And generally there's loads of different great articles about this, or you can come to my channel, obviously we talk about these things. And ultimately things like domain verification. So you just basically have to add a bit of code to your website, uh, making sure that you've set your events in prioritization. So you have purchased at the top, of course, just those are missed by such a large percentage of people right now. And that really ruins Facebook for people. So just that alone could be a really good win. Uh, that kind of clean matrix, that clean AB testing uh, is really important. Um, and then I, I think uh, with with Google uh, and Facebook, I would say uh, there's this there's a lot of in between people who are maybe spending one thousand pounds a month and they're like just trying to get past one times ROAS, maybe one and a half, two times. And there's it's that tipping point that sometimes clients have to go through. Where, for example, we had someone just last month they doubled their budget from a thousand five hundred, I believe it was, to just over three thousand, and their ROAS also more than doubled. And that was. It's, it's the machines of Facebook and Google. It's a paid ads game. It's a money game. So it jumping up that step further allows Facebook and Google their systems to maximize and automate properly around better data sets. So optimizing for conversions is always best. But if you're only getting four a month versus 4,000 a month, they're just better. So uh, pushing yourself into that discomfort and investing more will very likely actually also improve the actual return on investment that you receive. So um, making those scary leaps when you are starting to get your like feet in the ground and, and see some results is is worthwhile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So be ready to make investments into this side. Okay. You have to spend a little bit of money to make money in these platforms. And like uh, you're also yeah. like uh, teaching the algorithm a little bit. And like the algorithm is. Uh, your friend, uh, if you use yeah. alcohol. Yeah. Okay. Hey, this has been awesome. Thank you very much for joining the channel. We will cover advertising here, like uh, maybe once a year maximum, but uh, Max on his channel covers it on a weekly basis. And there's a ton of videos there. So please go and check it out. I will uh, leave out the link 
in the description, so you can also update uh, your advertising knowledge. And okay, once you have Max on the advertising side and me on the CRO side, like, uh, you'll have traffic that converts. You'll do very well, and uh, that's uh, going to be your secret to success. So, thank you very much for Max for joining, and uh, see you everyone in the next video. Thank you very much. It was really nice to speak to you, and uh, yeah, thank you very much.